Hey guys, Derek Best, Beacon Fight for Life. Over the journey, I've had the privilege of meeting and talking to professionals in all sorts of categories, um, psychology, uh, clinical, and again, uh, it's no different today. I'm at the uh, University of WA, and I have the pleasure to speak with uh, Associate Professor Rodrigo Becerra. Um, welcome. Thank Rodrigo. you. Thank you for having taken the time to speak to me today. Um, so Rodrigo's been uh, working in psychology, and he specialises, or he's got a PhD as a clinical psychologist, and he's been over 25 years in his own personal practice in uh, West Perth. But tell me a little bit about the Robin Winkler, or Winkler Clinic at the UWA. Sure, this is a clinic that uh, is run by the psychology department, mm -hmm. and it, it's where we train clinical psychologists and clinical neuropsychologists. Mm -hmm. So those two professions require people to pass you know, a lot of units and assessments and things like that, theory based if you mm -hmm. wish, but they also need to complete three placements, mm -hmm. uh, one internal and two external. So external will refer to placements in hospitals, clinics, in the, out, out in the community. Okay. But for that they need to pass their internal placement and that internal placement is this clinic. So here's where we offer them their first placement for clinical neuropsychologists. They, do, they have to do a lot of uh, neuropsychological assessments and clinical psychologists, uh, trainees, they need to see a certain number of clients. Okay. And they need to pass that and they are closely supervised by neuropsychologists or clinical psychologists. So that's my next question. It, it, what's the difference between a clinical psychologist and a, a neuropsychology or neuropsychological difficulties? Sure. Um, the clini clinical psychology is a profession that specializes, uh, and, and being simplistic here, but yep. It sort of focuses on mental health, psychological difficulties, psychiatric or psychological diagnosis like uh, depression, anxiety, borderline, bipolar disorder, all those psychological difficulties and diagnosis that people experience. So clinical psychology um, looks at uh, you know, the theory, the assessment and intervention of those uh, mental health difficulties. Whereas a clinical neuropsychologist looks at the difficulties, or it's a brain-based profession that looks at what happens to the brain, the actual uh, organic uh, brain, so to speak, and how that manifests in behaviors, cognitions, and emotions too. And they tend to focus on the difficulties coming from brain impairment or brain difficulties or any damage uh, of any sort, mm -hmm. and uh, expressing e.g. cognitive difficulties. So okay. they look a lot at the memory, attention, executive functioning, and so on, mm -hmm. those, those sort of things. So that's the neuro side of things? That's the neuropsychologist looking at, yep. Yep. Uh, so you also worked in hospitals, both in Perth and Fremantle. What did you do there? At Sir Charles Gunner Hospital, I worked for 10 years, and funny enough, I worked in, the, in a neuropsychology setting. It was called uh, the State Head Injury Unit. And then at that time, we didn't have formal training in neuropsychology in Perth mm -hmm. or neuropsychology in Perth. There were only a few. I'm talking about many years ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they came from Melbourne or Sydney, so we didn't have training in neuropsychology. It was in Australia. So there were a group of psycholo clinical psychologists like myself who you know, trained on site, so to speak, and based on experience. So mm -hmm. I conducted a lot of neuropsychological assessment and therapy for people with an acquired brain injury yep. and did that for 10 years. And then went to uh, Fremantle Hospital where I worked at, in a psychiatric, uh, it's, it's called Alma Street, so it's a psychiatric unit where we, in my case, I run groups for emotional regulation and you know depression and borderline, bipolar, OCD, those sort of things for people who have been admitted to hospital mm -hmm. and they were discharged but they needed to be followed up okay. uh, by the system. And so I've been doing that for, you know, I did that for another 10 years. There was a bit of an overlap there, mm -hmm. but I kept my private practice throughout. So that's been the common. Okay. Um, we're going to touch on emotional regulations in a little sure. bit, but the reason I do what I'm doing now is because I lost three mates several years back to suicide and I missed the signs. One of them actually came to me just before he did it mm. and I didn't realise. So 
what we do at the Beacon Fight for Life is we provide education to the community or to our community that's watching on how can they, you know, maybe handle life a little bit better. Sure. And so to, to, to find, to not go through and to, you know, to take their own life. Um, so before we lead into the emotional regulation, do you think um, it's ever too late to seek therapy? No, it's never too late to seek therapy. I think I strongly suggest people to 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 look for help, and therapy is proven to you know be quite effective, mm -hmm. and it works. So there might be differences in different models, different theories, but every psychologist and now every psychiatrist and every sort of mental health uh, commentator with a you know, with some background, they all admit that therapy works. Right? Mm -hmm. The amount of work on how it works, well, there are discussions there, yep. but uh, everyone agrees that it does work. So it's never late to go and see ther uh, a therapist. Yep. Yeah. Do you think that all people that, you know, I mean, this might not be your strength, but again, it's a question because it's you're into psychology. Do you all think that all people that take their own life have had an addiction or you know, are affected by you know, alcohol or drugs? I don't think so. I think there is a strong component of drugs and alcohol which might amplify the suicidal tendencies in some cases, but there are many people who engage in self-injurious behaviors or commit suicide who do not have an addiction, mm. uh, alcohol or any sort of substance. Uh, there are you know, very horrific uh, experiences in life and some people might not have the resilience to face those. There might be, you know, irreversible. There is trauma. There are a lot of things. So it's a very complex uh, area, and it is true when we assess risk, uh, we we ask if there is alcohol because that might inhibit, uh, you know, uh, certain protective factors and mm -hmm. might amplify or elevate the risk of suicide. That's a risk factor. It is not the cause. Of okay. The, yeah. So it just it makes it more. Uh, what's the word I want to use? So it's it's more or more of a risk because of the state of mind because of the alcohol right. and the drugs. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So that leads us to the emotional regulation. Is what I'm really interested to speak to sure. you. Know, I believe you're very um, knowledgeable in this area. So what is emotional regulation? Sure. Um, I think it's an important distinction is between emotions and moods. Right. So. An emotion is a very short experience, very powerful, but very short experience that could go for a few seconds or a few minutes, right? So when you are sad, that's an emotion, right? Yeah. And people tend to conflate or to, to perhaps get confused between that and, and a mood. So depression is a mood disorder because depression is a diagnosis, for example, mm -hmm. that you could have depression for, let's say, a, a year yeah. right? or two years or six months. And an emotion lasts for a few seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so the idea is, so sadness is an emotion, depression is a mood, anger is an emotion, hostility is a, is a longer sort of uh, affective experience, mm -hmm. um, fear is, is an emotion, anxiety is a mood, and so on and so forth. So what we find is that those short affective experiences called emotions mm -hmm. are, qu are quite overwhelming and usually tend to to extend or amplify the mood. So if you exp if you have a lot of uh, negative emotions, right? So you're feeling down, you put negative or heavy movies, or you talk to a friend who doesn't, yeah, yeah. Which is normal for people to have a negative emotion. It, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Emotions in general are quite normal, right? Yeah. I, I think what we emotions are actually responsible for our existence on this planet. If you don't get sad, if a mother doesn't get sad because the baby is crying, mm -hmm. it's not very adaptive, right? Okay, so sure. in that case, a, a, a so-called negative emotion is quite adaptive. Yeah. So if you don't get scared walking down an alley at three in the morning, uh, you know, it's not adaptive. It, the, so fear, sadness are good things. If nature was could talk, would tell us, why do you go about those negative emotions? They're quite good. They're yeah. warning you. So emotions are warning signs. Yeah. But like with everything, they could go a little bit too. The frequency and intensity could make a natural thing like an emotion into something that is not very adaptive. Yeah. 
and that happens with everything in, in, in human beings. You know, most things are there for a reason, but unfortunately, some people might experience emotions in a, such an intensive or strong way, and it might stay with them longer than natural mm -hmm. the natural life of an emotion that tends to feed into the mood, e.g., a depression. You know. So, how long is it they had that negative emotion? Before, when, before it would become a problem or when you should seek help with it? Well, in psychology, one of the, you know, a dictum in psychology is that it's not a problem unless it's a problem, <laughs> which basically means if you're sad and someone says to me, I'm sad, yeah, that's okay if you're sad. If you mm -hmm. just watch a movie that was very sad or your girlfriend gave you the flick, it's okay to be sad. Absolutely. The difficulty comes when you reject that sadness and you think you need to no do something about mm -hmm. it. Therefore, I have to you know, call my ex 10 times per day and say, I have this emotion of sadness, which means it's, it's wrong that we, we broke up, or I have this, and so on and so forth. So the idea is that it's not the emotion itself that is a problem. It's the intensity, the frequency, and the intrusiveness. So people be, uh, being sad or being fearful or being uh, angry is not an issue. Is how that impacts in your life. You know, a classic example is obsessive compulsive disorder. We all have rituals, right? Mm -hmm. I double check whether I am plugged the ion, you know, mm -hmm. a few times because I remember a story my mother told me about someone burning a house because, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, my students usually tell me, oh, I have that. You know? So it's not a problem. But what if you have to spend two to three hours per day checking mm -hmm. that you switch the lights off? And, you know, then it becomes a problem. But yeah. we all have some little obsessions that we, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, I keep going. We are, as I said before, we are all a little bit sad sometimes. That's okay. Mm -hmm. But what if it stops you from working or forming meaningful relations? Then it's, then it's a problem. Then it's a problem. For you, for that person. For that person. Yeah. yeah. Um, so is it fair to say, you know, I mean, anxiety, depression, they're really buzzwords at the moment, you know, people, and they're, and they're real, but, you know, is it, would it, is it true to say that they'd be the two main um, uh, emotions that you would deal with, or are they moods, emotion, depression and anxiety? Are they mood or emotion? If, if, you, if you mean the prevalence of their moods, their, their, their conditions, so psychological uh, mm -hmm. conditions and diagnosis, anxiety and depression, if you mean if there is high prevalence in today's society, mm -hmm. those, yeah, yeah, they're very high, yeah. anxiety and depression. So someone that's watching this now, yeah. so we can you know, help them through that process, so how can they change their perspective or, you know, about their belief that they, they feel depressed or they feel sad or they feel anxious? You know, what's, how can we use emotional regulation to work sure. through that? Sure. So what we postulate, and it's not just us, it's you know, the, the literature and, and our clinical experience, is that the short-lived affective phenomenon like sadness tends to feed depression, the mood. So it's a vicious circle. The more depressed you feel, the more or the less motivated you feel to seek positive emotion. Uh, you don't want to go to that party. Mm -hmm. You don't want to watch a, a comedy. You want to watch a, a French film that's depressing by you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, those short emotional experiences, because they are in line with, with the mood, uh, tends, to be, uh, it tends to perpetuate the problem. Right? So what we say is that there is a lot of science, there is a lot of uh, research about that, the way you regulate those emotions, right? Mm -hmm. One of them is education, right? So what is an emotion? What is mood? What's the natural life of an emotion? We want to demystify the notions of emotions being an impenetrable, mystic, mysterious thing. We're more into naturalizing it, which basically means emotion is like uh, another thing that happens to human beings. And it can be studied with scientific, uh, methodologies, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's a good thing, right? So w the first thing psychoeducation tackles is it, this is an emotion, this is mood, this is how it lasts, this is what happens to your body, right? There is something called emotional brain in the middle of your brain called the limbic system, mm -hmm. and that limbic system seems to be 
very, very involved in emotions, right? So we have experienced its own literature looking at brain injury in the limbic system, whereby emotions are amplified or they're totally deflated, uh, there is no emotions, and so on and so forth. So emotions like memory or, you know, attention or, or other things is something that is deeply connected to the brain, is something that we can study, and is something that you can regulate. Psychoeducation will look at this terminology and these sort of things so people stop thinking like, that's it, emotions are totally uncontrollable. And we find that when people believe that m emotions can, to some extent, be control or influence, because some people don't like the word control mm -hmm. uh, or influence, there is a better outcome. So pe if I go out there into the community and I ask everyone, do you believe emotions are useful? Do you believe emotions can be controlled or influenced? Those who say yes tend to have less depression, anxiety, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. That means you have some control over your emotions. It's not something mysterious that comes out mm -hmm. and it dominates you, right? So that's a big role of psychoeducation, terminology, findings, and hope, right? Because if you tell people, you know, there is something you can do about it. slave of emotion. Yeah. No, you can be in control. The second step is to do something about it so that you are not overwhelmed with an emotion. So basically saying, you know, if you're angry, you validate the experience. Hey, being angry is not a problem. So many people might think mm. that, that, that being angry, you have to go and hit, or you have to go yeah. and tell someone off. Or some, no, anger is an emotion, aggression is a behavior. Mm -hmm. They're two different things, mm -hmm. right? So to validate the, and the experience of anger, say, it's okay if you're angry. You don't have to be aggressive and go. Yeah. Right? That's a different thing. So the first step is to believe that you can change it. Yeah. And the second step is to understand it, like sit in it. Is that what you're saying? And validate it. And validate yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. If you feel your partner is at a party laughing with someone else, you know, and she's having a, or he's having a good time, you know, it's okay to feel a bit jealous. Why not, right? Yeah. Now, if you think, therefore, you have to do something about it, mm -hmm. if you recognize that it's a natural emotion, and you can sit with it, you trust your partner, everything is okay, you validate that initial uh, mm -hmm. emotional experience, and it's okay, nothing will happen to you. You're not going to die if you're sad, if you're going to be jealous. So if you, so if you, yeah. so you feel jealous, you go, I feel jealous. Mm. But that's, a, that's normal because of the exactly. situation. Exactly. And then it's a fleeting part, it's a fleeting you know, thought. Well, what we tend to say is that there, there is a primary emotional response we, which we call the primary emotions. You know, I feel a bit jealous, I feel, feel a bit angry, I feel a bit sad. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm. Usually the difficulties come from the secondary emotions the emotion of the beliefs emanating from the primary emotion. I feel jealous. I shouldn't feel jealous. He should be doing this or she should be doing mm -hmm. So I feel a second emotion. So if you're highly religious and you feel jealous or you feel angry, perhaps you might feel shame because you felt angry. So that secondary emotion of about the primary emotion tends to be more problematic but if you know that feeling anger because someone wronged you, it's okay to feel angry. You don't have to go and you know hit someone for mm -hmm. that. They, 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 it validates you, and then you start to observe your emotions about emotions or secondary emotions. So my take from that is that you know when when you start to think external, they should, he should, then it becomes a problem because. You've, you've led leaving it in someone else's hands, but you can control what's happening in your head exactly. by, thinking, by thinking, oh, that's normal, I'm yeah. a little bit jealous. Yeah. And then control it. Exactly. Well, what, we, what I tend to think is that we all, have, because the first step, as you put it, is accepting that emotion. So mm. acceptance is one of the very first important steps. And then observe that the secondary emotion comes after your primary emotion because the way, you, the way you were brought up, because you were told in church or by someone, you cannot ever feel angry, that's shame on you. Mm. So if you feel anger, then you're gonna feel shame, then you're gonna hide it, 
then you're going to feel disturbed by it, frustrated. So it's a whole chain of events mm -hmm. by not accepting that primal emotion yeah. and believing that it's a natural occurrence rather than, my God, I must be a bad person. I tend to say to my students, if everyone accepts the primal emotions without having to do necessarily something about it, we psychologists would be out of work. Because <laughs> usually the main difficulties, I mean, I'm talking about the, the most common presentation. There are mm -hmm. other sets of presentations about bi bipolar, schizophrenia, mm -hmm. that is a different, different topic. Yeah. But even then, some emotion regulation skills are involved in those, but they, they seem to be more brain-based type of difficulties. But I'm talking about the, the psychological spectrum that mm -hmm. we normally face. Before I, before I you know, leave you to give us your final say on you know, how to manage your emotions, um, thank you. If people want to get hold of you, how can they get hold of you? You've got a, your own private practice in uh, West Perth? In West Perth, yeah. yeah so I'll put, that, I'll put that link on uh, this post. Sure. But just what would, what would you say in a few sentences to people that, that are struggling with their emotions? Sure, sure. Yeah, I, 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 I would say, look, there is help for that. Emotions are something that there is a good version of that. Primary emotions and, uh, are okay or natural if we accept them. But if you have difficulties accepting them, you know, look for help. It's okay to go to a psychologist and say, I feel extremely jealous. I feel extremely angry. You know, wh what is it? Mm. And there'll be psychologists or counselors and who are going to say, okay, that's okay, that's a natural thing, you know. When I run OCD groups, one of the most, um, the, the most common comment is like, oh my God, there are other people who have this problem, mm -hmm. washing their hands for 20 minutes uh, mm -hmm. every time I go to the loo, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, and that helps them. It, it imme immediately validates it, because it's something that is more common than you think, mm -hmm. but the important thing is to do something about it, talk to someone, when you have a headache that persists, or you have a stomach ache, or something, you go to a doctor. Yeah. You know, you're, you're not ashamed of that. Yeah. And what I'm saying is that with a psychologist, it's the same. It's not shame of that. It's okay to say, look, I'm doing really well, but I, when I get angry, or I'm doing really well, but I'm feeling down, and I don't see meaning, you know. It's okay to talk to someone. I think it's, it's no shame. I mean, many people do, yeah. you know, but it seems to be, in some circles, for whatever reasons, it seems to be secretive. I mean, there's something wrong with you. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with you. It's actually quite normal. It's absolutely normal. It's and normal. there is help for that. Yeah. Well, on that note, Dr. Becerra, thank you very much. My for pleasure. Taking, for thank taking you for yeah, talking with the opportunity. Uh, and okay, guys, that's Derek Best from the Beacon Fight for Life. Um, make sure you take the time to smile today. Thanks very much. <laughs>